privilege to introduce uh, to you as our next guest speaker, a former student of mine, a uh, fellow Northwood Timberwolf, somebody who uh, has gone on to bigger and better things since then, uh, Mr. Jonathan Williams. Jonathan Williams is currently the director of the Tax and Fiscal Policy Task Force for the American Legislative Exchange Council, where he works with state legislators and the private sector to develop free market fiscal policy in the states. Prior to joining ALEC, Jonathan served as the staff economist at the Tax Foundation, authoring numerous tax policy studies. His work has been featured in many publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Forbes, and Investors Business Daily. Williams is a contributor to The Examiner and writes a syndicated column for the Flint Hill Center for Public Policy in Wichita, Kansas, where he also serves as an adjunct fiscal policy fellow. He is a contributing author to the Reason Foundation's Rich States, Poor States Annual Privatization Report and has written for Tax Analysts, a scholarly journal dedicated to tax issues. He is also a frequent guest on radio and television, including Fox Business News. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Williams. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is great to be with the uh, fellow bunch of Northwood students. And uh, greetings from the land of make-believe, Washington, D.C., uh, where I came from the other day, and I'll be heading back to. And uh, thank you, Dr. Matchek, for that very warm introduction. And uh, as I like to say sometimes, it proves that not all forms of inflation are all that harmful after all. So I appreciate that. And uh, I'm a tax economist, so that was a geeky joke. You don't have, that's okay. You don't have to laugh. Uh, you know the difference between an introverted tax economist or an extroverted tax economist, don't you? Now, the introverted tax economist looks at his shoes when he talks to you. On the other hand, the extroverted tax economist looks at your shoes when he talks to you. So that's the world I come from, and uh, I guess for the next couple hours, you're going to have to deal with it. And uh, we're going to talk with, uh, about some of the federal policies out there uh, that we're facing in D.C. Um, but then more importantly, for what, what I do on a daily basis, we're going to talk about some of the policies affecting the states. And I think that's awfully important today as we're running into a whole lot of problems in D.C. I think the states can continue to show the federal government what to do and maybe what not to do to avoid some of the mistakes that we've been seeing in the states as well. Um, it's kind of interesting to note, um, the, the organization that I work with, just so you know, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based in D.C. We've been around uh, for about 40 years now, actually, going on our 39th year this year. And we're a group of state legislators from all 50 states. So we have members from Michigan. We've got over 2,000 state legislators who pay uh, dues to join. And we're kind of like a membership organization for uh, free market leading state legislators. So think state legislators that believe in the Northwood idea. Uh, these are people who belong to our organization. And one of these state legislators has a very big spot in Michigan as uh, former Governor John Engler was one of our founding members back in 1973 when he was like you know, 18 years old or something and got elected to the state house for the first time. So we've got a, a big connection to Michigan. Uh, as Dr. Matchek mentioned, I'm a 2005 graduate of Northwood um, and I, I come from the Tri-Cities. And so this issue of economic development is awfully personal uh, for me coming from Saginaw and for any of you that have been uh, some, from some of the cities um, in this part of the state, Detroit and Pontiac and, and Flint and some of the others that have really struggled, I mean, look at the data from Saginaw, for instance. Over the last 40-some years, Saginaw has gone from about 100,000 population to about 50,000 population. And, of course, Detroit's gone from over 2 million to about 700,000. And, you know, you read these national stories, uh, basically, sometimes when I say I'm from Michigan, I just get made fun of because they say, oh, you guys did everything wrong over the last uh, couple of decades, and now, I mean, your, your state's falling apart. Now, I'm going to get into this more. I mean, I think Michigan's starting to turn the corner, starting to rebound now. Um, but it, it was kind of tough being from Michigan and being an economist and going around and telling states what they need to do on taxes, and they're like, you're from Michigan? Uh, how, does that <laughs> how does that give you any uh, authority to tell us what to do? But, I mean, it, it, is, it was a little tiring there for a while, reading Wall Street Journal uh, 
editorials and whatnot talking about how there were 10,000 homes being bulldozed down in the city of Detroit and how Michigan was turning paved roads into gravel roads because it saved on upkeep and things like that. Um, it, was, it was a difficult, you know, single state recession basically over the last decade. Now, um, it's, it's interesting, you know, the founders, when they created our, our system of government, our constitution, basically put together a 50-state free trade zone. Of course, it wasn't 50 states at the time, but set up a system by which states could act in some degree of autonomy in creating the Interstate Commerce Clause to the Constitution, which has been highly abused by courts and by the federal government over the last uh, 80 to 90 years especially, but basically created a system where the federal government can step in to regulate interstate commerce, but to the fact that they wanted to keep a system that's free of basically uh, like state level tariffs they were afraid of and things like that where states and local governments would become very um, uncompetitive and become very regional in their in their focus and so the Congress when they set up our system uh, when, when the states ratified it I should say they set up this 50 laboratories of democracy basically that then later on Justice Lewis Brandeis talked about as we've got these 50 basically case studies, and being a good Northwood student, you know, you've, you've dealt in case studies quite a bit over your time at Northwood, I'm sure, and so that's one of the neat things about what we do, is we get to analyze these 50 laboratories of democracy and see, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And so what I'm going to talk about today is my most recent um, publication, Rich States, Poor States, and this is the fifth edition that just came out about a month ago, and back in April we released it. And I'll be, I, have, I brought a box with me. We'll be uh, selling copies uh, a little bit later this afternoon if you'd like to take a hard copy back. And I would also mention that it's available as a free download on our website as well, alec.org. My book sales people hate me for that, but uh, since we're a nonprofit, our goal is to get these type of uh, economic data out to people, and we, we want to make that available for free. And what Rich States, Poor States is, is basically trying to analyze what works and what doesn't. So in terms of free enterprise policy versus kind of a more statist government uh, run tax and spend philosophy, what are the policies that work? And we take a look at it from the last 10 years of data. We go back a full half century worth of data to see, you know, what are the policies that actually matter? What are the policies that create jobs, that create a higher standard of living for the states? Because believe it or not, you know, we have some pretty desperate states out there in terms of differentiation between two groups of states. I think there's almost like a balkanization effect, as I like to put it sometimes, is between the 50 states, is that we have a group of states that are the growth states out there today. Those are the Texas, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about Texas and the job creation model that they've had over the last 10 years. You've got states like um, Utah, uh, like some of the western states doing very well today, some of the southern states doing very well today. On the other hand, you've got a group of states like New York, New Jersey, Illinois, uh, Maryland, even Michigan fell in that category, of, as we mentioned, over the last 10 years um, that have really been in a, almost a managed state of decline. And now Governor Mitch Daniels, uh, our friend down to the south in Indiana, he likes this idea of competition between the states especially. He's a very competitive guy. And at one point, I don't know if it's still there, but he put billboards up on the Michigan-Indiana state line to say, come on into Indiana for lower taxes, lower costs, and, you know, start a business here. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. He also says, you know, living next to Illinois because of all their problems is kind of like living next to the Simpsons. It's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, state to be next to. Uh, but, you know, I, I tell you what, the Midwest... Uh, in general is, uh, has been, you know, suffered over the last couple of decades. The auto industry certainly hasn't helped that, but I'll tell you what, state policy making matters a lot as well, and that's what rich states, poor states is, you know, what can legislators do to make their states more competitive for job creation, economic development, and higher standard of living. Now before we talk too much about the 50 laboratories, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on in Washington, D.C., uh, because as they say, Bad news usually flows downhill, and uh, we've got a lot of bad news in Washington, D.C. these days. And almost before every presentation, I have to stop and take a look at the debt clock. You've gone, everybody, who's all gone to the debt clock website? Google the debt clock when you go home and, and when you have a little bit of time. It's a really eye-opening site to show exactly what the pace, uh, the velocity of growth is out there of our national debt and from our state debts and some of the liabilities we carry as a country. Now, who
who's all been following the Greece uh, situation? Uh, it's been all over the Wall Street Journal. Morris, I know, has been following it. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to escape what's gone on in Europe now uh, over the last several years. And I just read a headline today. I mean, the euro may be on a, a course to um, basically blowing up as a currency. Uh, you have Greece now uh, in an awful situation. I was in Greece last year. I witnessed some of the riots that were going on in Athens when I was there. I saw the, the, the postal workers and the like rioting in the streets. Of course, basically, Greece was burning over the last year because of the riots and because of their levels of debt and unsustainable spending had grown over the years. Now, most people are shocked when I say this, but when you look at our levels of debt as the United States, we're not that far behind Greece. In fact, our uh, velocity is catching up to that of Greece. If you look at our debt to GDP ratio, uh, if you look at total debt, look at our GDP, our debt is now larger than our entire economic output in the United States for an entire year. You know, it's, I believe we're at 15.7 trillion. I have to check that because it grows so quickly. Um, when I first made out these sketchy of notes for this new publication, it was at 15.3 trillion. You know, we've moved that much in our national debt uh, over the last uh, several weeks and months. Uh, it, it's pretty scary, and I would encourage everybody to go to the national debt clock and take a look at it uh, if you haven't already. Now, there's a couple of reasons why, of course, we aren't in the situation of Greece. Um, one of which is we're still the world's reserve currency, and that certainly has its benefits. Is um, you know that's not going to allow us to fall quite as quickly as Greece. But if we keep up the trajectory that we're going as a nation, and I think that's the larger point here, is this is unsustainable the trajectory that we're on. If you were to take our entire national debt that we accumulated from the time of our founding to the time of George W. Bush it would not equal the amount of debt that we've accumulated since that point to today. That's how quickly we've grown in terms of our national debt. It's unbelievable. It cannot be sustained. We've got to have a, a really a, um, a new normal, I think, in, in the way that we analyze uh, federal spending and taxes. Uh, and that's, unfortunately, the bad news at the federal level when it comes to debt. Um, we also, I think, have a, a huge problem at the national level on competitiveness. We have a competitiveness deficit at the national level, and I think that may be even more of a problem than our national debt, actually, at this point, is that you never can raise enough tax revenue to make up for the spending if your tax system is uncompetitive, if your general system of government is uncompetitive, our regulatory system is uncompetitive. You, know, you take a look at, for instance, things like the Keystone Pipeline which was supposed to be a very broadly supported by unions, by conservatives, by uh, even some uh, of both parties, all political parties. I think it pulled about 70% of Americans supported the Keystone Pipeline, bringing uh, oil from Canada down to the refineries in the southern United States. Of course, that decision was, was axed uh, because of uh, certain environmental uh, concerns. You take a look at, um, anybody here read George Will? Anybody? We have a couple here that read George Will. He's a great, great columnist if you don't read him. Uh, he's a fantastic uh, view on uh, what's going on across the country. He writes for the Washington Post, which I generally don't advocate you read the Washington Post, but George Will's column is syndicated in a lot of other papers, so I encourage you to read those other papers where George Will's column is. But he, he made a, a point that I, I thought I would tell the brief story about our competitiveness problem. He made the point that there's a port in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and it's been under study now for, I believe, about you know, five to ten years. The Army Corps of Engineers has been looking at the Port of Charleston. That's about how long they were looking at the Keystone Pipeline, uh, coincidentally quite as well, uh, for approval. And what uh, Charleston needed was, I believe they needed the port to be uh, deepened by uh, something like you know, a foot or something like that to be more competitive, maybe three feet uh, to be more competitive and allow for larger ocean-going vessels to be able to come and bring in their goods from overseas and be a major trade hub. The problem is, is that the Army Corps of Engineers still hasn't given it an approval now, and it's been you know, five to ten years they've been studying this. Meanwhile, of course, all these uh, you know, vessels are going to other ports, some in the United States, some not in the United States. All this international trade is going to other places because of you know, really bad regulation like that, that we're not allowing these type of uh, approvals to happen. So I think we have a major competitive deficit on those issues. Also, as of April 1st, you all know, anybody have an idea what happened on April 1st that impacts us tremendously as a country when it comes to competitiveness? 
Any ideas? And it's not an April Fool's joke either. All right, so on April 1st, what happened was the United States became the highest tax corporate country in the, in the industrialized world. Our tax rate didn't move. We didn't raise taxes on April 1st, but what happened was Japan lowered their corporate tax rate several percentage points, and now the U.S. stands alone as the highest corporate tax country in the world. Now, 10 to 20 years ago, if you look at the corporate tax rate in the United States, we were somewhere middle of the pack, and we haven't raised our corporate tax rate in a long time. Uh, since 1986 is the last time we've made major changes to our corporate tax system in the country. But what happened is all of our trading partners, the OECD countries, uh, and places like Japan have been lowering their corporate taxes now for a decade or two. Well, we've been stagnant, and in the process now we've isolated ourselves as being the highest business taxes in the world. Now, if you remember during uh, the 2008 campaign, this came up during some of the debates, and um, you know, at the time, candidate McCain was saying that this was going to be a problem. The United States was um, going to be a high-tax country when it comes to businesses. Candidate Obama at the time said, "Well, yeah, you know, that's our that's our official stated rate, but no company actually pays the 35 percent rate." Now, there is some truth to that, uh, and I'll, you know, because of our very complicated system of taxes with uh, the credits, deductions, and some of the other ways that we've created a system that's become awfully complex with about 60,000 pages of regulations to the IRS code. Uh, sometimes I kind of wish I could bring the entire IRS code and the regulations with me and slam it down on the stage when I'm giving a presentation, but they do have weight limits on bags these days, so you can't really fly with it. Uh, but n nonetheless, um, it's, it's a very interesting look, and, and I think um, there was a recent study done by the Cato Institute. Anybody here familiar with the Cato Institute? It's a free market libertarian uh, think tank in Washington, D.C. They came out with a study from one of Canada's tax scholars talking about how the effective rate, even when you consider quite a bit of the deductions, exemptions, the other things for U.S. businesses, is still about 35% when you add in the federal and the state-based corporate rates, putting the United States still highest in terms of effective rate as well. So the idea that businesses don't pay the tax, well, sure, sometimes you'll see the GE, you know, if you look at the headlines, once in a while GE paid zero in corporate taxes last year, and certainly that's a function of our very complex, convoluted tax system, but, you know, you can't really fault them for taking advantage of the system that's there. But overall, across the economy, corporations do pay a very fair share of taxes, and in fact, some of the highest in the world. Now, you could say, well, that's fine, we should, you know, have businesses pay more, but the fact of the matter is, we live in a pretty dynamic marketplace. We live in a very dynamic world where companies are not set and fixed in stone where they're going to be located. Now, Morris has done some work on this, but <clears throat> in Ireland, of course, they, re they lowered their corporate tax rate, uh, I believe, to 12.5% from 50%. Uh, in the last uh, decade or so. Now, they've seen some problems since then because of spending and some, some bad government oversight. However, what they saw was, I believe it was something like a 1,000 multinational companies either moved manufacturing operations or moved their corporate headquarters to Ireland after they made that change. And so what we're going to talk about when we talk about state policy is how mobile capital is, how mobile businesses, how mobile individuals are. They react very strongly to government incentives and disincentives in this case. But the, in the, at the international context as well, um, it's very proven. And in, in Ireland is a, is a good example of how when you get it right, you know, companies will come, businesses will come, and, you know, you have to have businesses to create jobs. And we're talking quite a bit about job creation at the national level, but we're not taking the broader look at, you know, what does create jobs. Capital, businesses create jobs. On the other hand, the United States finds itself on the wrong side of that equation at this point now at the highest business taxes uh, in the world. And I think one of our biggest impediments, quite honestly, to getting it right when it comes to solving our competitiveness deficit at the national level is the fact that we have, in a way, um, more, I, I think, in terms of rhetoric and class warfare than I've seen in a, in a long time. I mean, it's been there, but I mean, we're always talking about now the haves and the have-nots. We're talking about 1% and 99%. We're talking about all these strange things looking, in a way, to divide people. But in, in effect, if we don't get it right on competitiveness, you know, the haves and the have-nots may be the have-nots and the have-nots. Uh, we have to be very serious when it comes to making America competitive again. I spent some time in, in Hong Kong uh, over New Year's, and I'll tell you what, anybody been to Hong Kong? 
All right, we've got maybe a couple here have been to Hong Kong. One of the things that really struck me about Hong Kong is just the sense of entrepreneurism that there is in Hong Kong. The fact that almost everybody, it seems like, is involved in private sector work and, and creating a business, just the, the sense of small business creation, just the sense of work ethic that's there in Hong Kong. In a way, uh, thinking about it, I was there for a few days and being the, you know, kind of the introspective economist that I am, I, I started, you know, a little bit worrying in the fact that if the United States doesn't start getting our act together, uh, we're going to be overtaken by places like Hong Kong and some of these other places in Singapore that have been so industrious and, and you know, have really moved the ball forward quite a bit in terms of competitiveness. Now, as I mentioned, the issue of economic development is pretty personal coming from Saginaw. There are a lot of other places across the country, though, that, I mean, when I talk about Saginaw and see, you know, people's faces when I say, we've lost half of our population in the last 40 years, and so has Detroit, and then, you know, people's jaws kind of fall to the floor when you say that. I mean, in other parts of the country, that's unheard of. It's unheard of. I mean, you might have stagnant population where you haven't gained any population in a lot of years, um, but over you know, the course of my travel, and last year I was in about 40 states and traveled about 150,000 miles across the country uh, working with state legislators and going to state capitals. When I give presentations, they're shocked. I mean, they, they had no idea the magnitude of the type of loss that Michigan has experienced. Now, in a way, um, it can be useful, like I said, you know, both the good examples across the 50 state laboratories and the bad examples can both be somewhat useful in terms of try not to repeat the mistakes of places like Michigan and some of the other states that have been uh, faltering. Um, so I think if you were to, um, let me click through here a couple of, I talked a little bit about what ALEC is. Um, I want to talk about the two sides of the fiscal coin because when we're talking about fiscal policy, uh, as you've learned in your intro to economics and, and some of your other courses at Northwood is that Fiscal policy is talking about taxes and spending and talking about how government goes about uh, doing that type of policy. And you really don't, and you really can't have a discussion, an honest conversation anyways, about taxes without having a discussion about spending, and especially at the state level. Now, in Washington, we don't balance our budgets. We don't come close to balancing our budgets, and that's one of the big reasons why we have the uh, 15.7 national debt, uh, trillion national debt that we have. Now, at the state level, it's very different. Believe it or not, 48 out of the 50 states have in their state constitutions or a statutory requirement to at least show some sort of a balanced budget effort. Now, in some states like California, it's more or less a, a joke and a wink, wink, nod, nod, we're going to balance our budget, and then they just continue to borrow and do other things uh, to continue their spending spree in California. Now, but in many other states, it's a pretty strict balanced budget requirement uh, that actually requires people to live within their means, a pretty novel concept uh, to everyone uh, in the private sector that does it every, every month anyways. But the reason why... Um, it's so important to consider taxes and spending is at the state level, of course, there's no printing presses. You cannot print dollars at the state level. Now, I'm convinced that if they were allowed to, California and Illinois and some of these states would be in much worse shape than they actually are because they would be printing uh, up a storm to cover their problems. But they don't. They can't do it, and they have to balance their budget. So to have a discussion about tax policy, you have to consider the other side of the fiscal policy equation. Also, um, talking about some of the basics of Economics 101, uh, in the first part of Rich States, Poor States here, um, we have the 10 golden rules of effective taxation. And basically, this is applying Economics 101 that you've probably learned a lot of these principles at Northwood, uh, taking Philosophy 110 and some of the other courses that you've taken if it's still called Philosophy 110. I might be, uh, <laughs> might be dating myself a little bit there. Uh, but, for instance, the 10 golden rules of taxation, some of these are just basic economics 101 things. When you tax something more, you get less of it. When you tax something less, you get more of it. Now, that's basic economics 101. That's behavioral responses to, to changes in tax policy or changes in government incentives. Uh, the, the second principle we like to talk about is individuals work and produce goods and services to earn money for present or future consumption. Now that's um, a little bit different 
because in sometimes in the view of Washington, D.C. and some of the state capitals is some policymakers think that people work for the privilege of paying taxes. And, of course, that's not the case. People work to make themselves better off. They work to make their families better off, a higher standard of living for their kids and their grandkids that they had. That's why people work. So when, for instance, when taxes come in and start you having high marginal tax rates, it creates a wedge between uh, work and reward. So instead of getting, you know, 90% uh, back on what you are uh, making, you know, let's say government marginal tax rates went up to uh, back up to 90% where they were before um, the JFK tax cuts of the 1960s. Our federal marginal tax rate was over 90% here in the United States where people kept 10 cents on the dollar of what they earned and it created that wedge between their work and their reward. And so what happens is logically is people don't work then when marginal tax rates get too high. And this is a phenomenon we're going to talk about a little bit later in one of the slides is one of my co-authors on Rich States, Poor States is Dr. Arthur Laffer, who is the founder of the Laffer Curve in economics and also uh, one of Ronald Reagan's economic advisors when, uh, when President Reagan was in office. And he came up with this curve. Allegedly, he drew it on a napkin one evening and at a cocktail party and said, there's this relationship that exists because people don't work for the privilege of paying taxes. When tax rates get too high, you have a reduction in the amount of work that people do because people say, hey, there's this trade-off between work and leisure. I can either kick it and go to the golf course and, and have a beer, uh, or I can work an extra few hours and only earn 10 cents on the dollar of what I'm actually taking. I can only take home 10 cents on the dollar. So this is always this trade-off that you make. You may not be conscious that you're making it, but let's say marginal tax rates got too high. Let's say you're doing contractual uh, work where you're 1099 work. You know, government doesn't withhold out of that money, but you have to figure that government's going to take a pretty good chunk of what you're making. Maybe it's not worth it sometimes to make that work. And so Dr. Laffer put out this relationship between um, high tax rates, lower economic production, lower growth, and as a result, lower tax revenue. And I'm going to talk more about that when we get to that slide. It's been ridiculed a bit over the years, but basically what it shows is government, you know, government policy impacts behavior. People do change their behavior based on taxes and other type of government policy, and that's one of our golden rules. And then we also talk about how much the factor that you're taxing matters. So the more mobile of a factor that you try to tax, it matters, because if you're taxing, for instance, somebody's capital gains, on their investment income, um, they can realize those capital gains from anywhere. You know, you don't have to be a resident of Michigan to realize a capital gain. You can go to Indiana, you can go to whatever state across the country and realize your capital gain without much effort. You just need to change your residency and live someplace six months in a day probably to get the, uh, the IRS to recognize that. Now you're going to pay a federal capital gains tax. But, you know, you're going to have a very big latitude over where you're going to pay your capital gains taxes at the state level. Um, and so the more mobile things like capital gains and those type of taxes on capital in general are most mobile, those type of things are most difficult to tax. And so when we talk about what is the ideal tax system, and there's a slide we're going to talk about what are the principles of good tax policy. An ideal tax system um, relies, of course, as least as possible as little as possible on these mobile types of factors because you know you're just not going to be able to catch them it's very difficult to tax capital across not only the states but across the world today and then we talk a little bit about um, how a good tax system has a low rate as low as possible uh, while still funding core government functions but a broad base. So you want to tax as much as possible, as many e economic activities as, pa as possible, but do it at, a, at the lowest rate possible so government doesn't get in the business of distorting the marketplace. And then finally, I think the most important of our 10 golden rules uh, of Economics 101 in Rich States, Poor States is, let's say in our 50 laboratories of democracy that we've talked about a little bit, let's say one state lowers taxes. If state A lowers taxes, state B raises taxes. With all else being equal, people and capital and businesses are going to move into the state that lowers taxes and has the overall better business climate. Now, some out there uh, will try to tell you that taxes don't matter and that policy doesn't matter. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the arguments they use, but what should be clear to everybody that's had a good Northwood education uh, and is a business background is 
all types of policy matters to, to matter to you as businesses. Now, if you're going to go out and run a business, you're going to you know, understand very quickly that business decisions are made at the margin. Maybe some of you already do run a business and understand how much these marginal types of costs matter to profitability and the fact of you know, whether you can hire a new employer or not or whether you can keep your doors open or not. But policy matters, and it matters for businesses at the margin. And when we're talking about these type of policies, they matter a whole lot for job creation and overall business success. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we go about ranking the states. Because one of the things we do in rich states, poor states, is we give a 50-state ranking of the states based on their overall level of competitiveness. We look at things like taxes, regulation, labor policy, uh, and things like that that we think have the most impact when it comes to job creation and making states more competitive. And the last 50 pages of the book, in fact, are devoted to that. Each state gets a page, and we rank those states on 15 factors uh, that we're going to talk a little bit more about. So as I mentioned, one side of the coin is spending. Now, as I mentioned at the state level, we don't have the luxury of printing money, and we certainly don't have the luxury of being able to run unbalanced budgets most of the time like uh, they do in Washington. So one of the last uh, one of the things that um, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University has done and that you'll be hearing from Morris Mateague tonight from Mercatus uh, one of the things that they do is they look at total state spending state and local spending over the last 10 years and they compare it with the growth of the private sector over the last 10 years and they give you a little bit of a relationship to say you know what is the growth of state and local spending been like over the last 10 years in relationship to private sector growth Anybody here want to take a guess, you know, what that relationship looks like? I mean, how much, I'll, I'll give you a hint. State and local government spending grew faster than private sector, uh, than the private sector over the last decade. Does anybody want to say by how much? Just throw out a few numbers. 70%, that's a pretty good guess. It's higher than that. 80, uh, keep going. That's good. That's close. 90%. State and local governments grew 90% faster than the private sector over the last 10 years. Unsustainable, obviously. We've had a pretty difficult last 10 years. We've had a couple of difficult business cycles. Uh, we've had some good years. We've had some bad years. But when you average it out and take a look at the change over the last decade, state and local governments spending 90% faster than the private sector. So it's not because of a lack of tax revenue that uh, state and local governments are suffering. When you, t when you hear about budget deficits, when you hear about Michigan having a, a big budget deficit, it's not because of a lack of tax revenues because generally spending on state and local level went up uh, that much over the last 10 years. Now, I just looked at the new numbers um, this week, and in fact, tax receipts across the states and localities are at an all-time high this year with the new numbers coming in from the census. So it's certainly you know, not a uh, lack of tax revenue that uh, is causing budget shortfalls in the states. One of the things that we kind of, uh, we've looked at now, one of the things that we've put together is the idea of priority-based budgeting for states and local governments. And <clears throat> I almost thought I'd have Morris come up here and give this part of the lecture because he's, he's done that much work on it himself. But some of the folks on our tax and fiscal policy task force have looked into this for quite a few years now. And one of the things we like to explain is one of the big problems with government is it is so uh, focused at, you know, what was last year's spending and then what kind of a growth factor can we apply to it to get, you know, the next year's spending instead of saying, the larger question is, should the government be spending money on these f uh, functions to begin with? Are they functions that are embedded within the size of state and, and federal government, for that matter, that the private sector should be doing uh, rather than government? Because, I mean, that's a very important question to have uh, or an important discussion to have. It used to be called the Yellow Pages test. Uh, but now nobody really uses Yellow Pages anymore, I don't think. So you could maybe call it the Google test now. Is it basically is that the private sector handles a responsibility and provides a good or a service. Why is the government in competition with the private sector? Because on average, the government trying to provide the same 
redundant good or service that's provided by the private sector, the private sector's probably got an angle on them to be able to provide at a lower cost and a higher quality than what government does because of the profit loss motive in the private sector. Um, and so one of the things we've asked is, why don't we start having this more fundamental question of what is the priority of government what are the priorities of government? What are the things that government exists to do that the private sector can't do? Because, you know, we probably all believe that there's a role of government. There may be an anarchist or two occasionally that I talk with that doesn't think government has any role. But generally, we believe to varying degrees that government should be involved at some level or not. Now, we can all debate that, and that would be a whole other uh, lecture. But what we're encouraging states to do, for instance, is ask some pretty key questions. What Washington State realized, they had a budget shortfall. Their governor, who then became a, um, a secretary in this administration or the Obama administration, he was a Democrat, but he worked with members of the Republican Party as well to say, we've got a budget shortfall. We can't withstand the tax increase right now. So what do we do about it? Let's prioritize. Let's do what any family or business has to do every month, and let's prioritize and make sure we're living within our means. Now, before they undertook this exercise in Washington State, the agencies in state government were not even required to have mission statements as to why they existed. There was no uh, requirement for showing value or showing some sort of uh, value creation on behalf of those agencies for taxpayers. Now, they did this, uh, and I, I actually did a survey of states a couple of years ago and found that only about half the states today require their agencies to have mission statements as to why they exist and what success looks like. You know, you have to have some sort of a measure, you would think, right? In the private sector, we're always measuring, trying to figure out uh, what something is uh, profitable or not. But evidently, that's still not the case with a lot of state governments. But to get back to Washington, is they balanced uh, about a $2.5 billion budget shortfall without a dime of tax increase increases because they went through this system of prioritizing wants versus needs. And that's a very important discussion for governments at all levels to have today. And that's something that we are encouraging our state legislative members to look at. Now, this one is, um, if you follow the Wall Street Journal and if you follow Inve Investors Business Daily and some of those publications that investors are looking at, and especially bondholders are looking at, um, does anybody want to take a uh, guess at what the largest threat to state finances is? And I should say to probably bondholders uh, in a certain uh, context as well. Exactly. Very good. Um, so the largest threat to state finances is the unfunded pension liabilities that are out there across the states today. Now, how many people have read about this uh, issue of unfunded liabilities in public finance systems and, and pensions, for especially state and local governments? Who, who's read about the, uh, obviously we've got one reader on this. Uh, we, so basically over the last several years, it's become, it's really come to a head uh, in terms of the problem. And the largest problem is these unfunded liabilities because 2008 really brought it to light. Now, generally what happens is, is when state and, government and local uh, government employees uh, retire, they have what's known as the defined benefit pension. That's separate from what uh, probably 90% of private sector workers are, have today when they enter the private sector workforce, which are what you're familiar with probably is the 401k system of, of pensions, uh, which is the defined contribution model of pensions. In the government, it's almost an exact re uh, reverse uh, relationship in the government, it's about 90% of state and local government workers have defined benefit pensions still. Uh, in the private sector, it's about 90% that have defined contribution pensions. Now, it's a big difference. And one of the reasons why this problem is, is gotten to the point where it is, is over the last 10 years, states basically stopped funding their pension obligations like they were supposed to and started taking that money that was supposed to be in a, a lockbox, if you will, for state uh, and local government employees and spending it on all kinds of other programs that they wanted to spend it on. Then 2008 comes along. You all, um, you all remember 2008. Uh, you remember you know, what kind of a loss that we saw in the stock market in 2008. In fact, many states that invest in these pension funds lost between 25 and 30 percent of their entire asset value in the crash of 2008 and that downturn. Now that was one of the major drivers why all of a sudden state pension funds 
are getting a, a really a tough look because that drove many pension funds into the critical funded stage where the, the government uh, accounting authorities say, you know, you have to take immediate actions to reform your pension systems if you don't want to go insolvent. And that's something that's a, a reality, and we've seen it in the news. If you've watched, uh, it's been in the national mainstream news as well. Many municipalities, cities and towns across the country have now started to declare bankruptcy and get out of the obligations that they're under. Now, Vallejo, California was really ahead of the curve, if you will, in a, <laughs> in a bad sense of that. They were several years ahead of this crisis in, in municipal finance. They went uh, basically been going through bankruptcy proceedings now for several years. The town manager was interviewed and said, well, you know, how did you get to a situation where your town was going to actually declare basically a receivership, go into receivership and declare bankruptcy? And the town manager said, it was because we were, pay we were paying three police departments and three fire departments, one that was working and two that were retired. And that's the fact of the matter is that the cost for public employees has gone astronomical when it comes to the defined benefit pension systems in the post-retirement health care. That's good. You know, and if you're given that as a public employee, you know, all the best to you because you've got a great deal. Uh, but the, now at the 2008 crash happening, states and localities are realizing that probably that's not going to be sustainable going forward. And not probably, it's definitely not going to be sustainable going forward. Now, there was some, uh, I was on Fox uh, News a couple of years ago and this was hitting and I was all ready for the interview and then like I was in the, uh, the green room before going on the air and uh, the, the guy's producer called me up and was like, you know, well, you want to talk about California's bankruptcy? And I was like, well, you know, I've never heard of state bankruptcy before, but we were actually having this conversation then at the national level is what happens when the states continue down the road that some of these municipalities were on, what happens if states like California or Illinois or some of those states start to get into position where they can't meet the obligations that they've promised. And when you look at it, there's really no section of U.S. bankruptcy law or there's no section in the Constitution that allows for a state to go bankrupt like many cities and, and towns have. Of course, now Detroit's in uh, financial, emergency financial manager mode, and I believe several other cities across Michigan are nearing that uh, if, if they haven't already gotten to that point. But there's no provision for states. So then, of course, the discussion was, well, what is the federal government going to come do to bail out the states because of this mountain of debt and the mountain of, of unfunded liabilities and pension systems? And that's a, that's a separate discussion to have. I, I really don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, if California and Illinois and some of these states continue going down the road they're at, uh, we, may, we may be talking about that again. Now, one of the things... Um, that is talked about. As I mentioned, there was a 30% loss in the stock market in 2008, or at least in many of the pension funds. Um, one of the things that pension funds do is they invest in, or they invest increasingly in very risky investments because many of the uh, pension funds say that they're going to earn, you know, believe it or not, they say they're going to earn an 8% rate of return every year in their pension funds, and that's how they make the actuarial uh, piece of it balance. Now, to do that, you need to invest in riskier and riskier activities because anybody have a, a savings account or a money market account these days? Uh, do you know what your interest you're getting on? Anybody see your statement recently? Yep. It's, it's way under a percent that you're getting in a savings account, way under a percent. Even in a CD or a money market, you're getting a percent or less probably. Now, what does that mean when states want to have an investment portfolio? Uh, that means they have to go higher, more into equities. It means they have to go into even things like derivatives and some pretty complex financial instruments that states started investing themselves into because they wanted to make the um, actuary uh, folks happy to say that we actually have a, a legible path to pay off our pension problems. Now, some folks out there say, now, they've actually said, hey, you know, these guys at ALEC are kind of fear mongers and they're just saying that there's a pension problem because they want to reform pension systems because states are going to grow their way out of the problem just how they uh, got themselves into it. They're going to be a rebound in the market and uh, they're going to grow their way out of the problem. Now, first of all, if you've read um, recently some of the financial commentators out there, Edward Lazier at Stanford actually just wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal that said, 
This is the weakest economic recovery we've had as a nation following a major national downturn. Uh, so we haven't, of course, seen any type of robust recovery yet. Now, let me take this uh, example, though, and apply sixth grade math. Because how many people remember from math that when you lose 30% and then when you gain 30% back, that you're not where you started. You've still got a hold to overcome. And here, I'll, I'll play this, the experiment out. You start with $100 and you lose 30%. You've got $70, $70 and you've lost your $30. Now, let's say you recover the 30%, like some people say, we're just going to grow our way out of this problem for states and finance. What you end up with is $91, not $100. Now, you got the difference of the $9 net loss. $9 looks pretty small on this slide. Now, repeat that you know, billions and billions of times, and then you're going to have the problem that states face. They've set themselves up to fail. Um, they've made promises that they know, in many cases, they cannot fulfill. They've promised, uh, it's very easy to make promises as an elected official when you don't think that you're going to be actually serving when you have to pay on those promises that you make. It's a very convoluted system that states have set themselves up for here on pensions. Now, let's just say if the states actually earned 8% rate of return starting in 2000, like they've all been estimating, it would require that the Dow Jones would be at 28,000 today um, because of that compound 8% rate of return since the year 2000, from January of 2000 to January of 2012, if the states would have received these rosy returns like they all say they uh, are going to get, that's where the Dow would need to be today to make that pension system uh, solvent for what they've talked about. And obviously there were a few books written, you know, back around 2000, the Dow at 20,000, the Dow at 40,000 or whatever. We were pretty excited that the tech bubble is going to continue forever. But obviously there's this thing known as the business cycle that occasionally comes back to bite us. And we have been, you know, fighting that uh, downward side of the business cycle there for a few years. We had some recovery and now we went back into it in 2008. But that just shows you right there is the folks that say, that there's no problem in state finances and that pensions are going to grow their way out of the problem and that we're just going to assume an 8% rate of return forever, that's the problem that they face today is that the Dow is not almost 30,000. Um, the Dow is nowhere close to 30,000. And that's why the recovery at the state level is going to be a much more complicated piece than what we think. Now, of course, the state pension systems resemble in a way what we face at the national level with Social Security and some of the other entitlement programs that we have is that putting the problem off and not taking care of it, not making reform that we need to make, financial problems don't go away on their own generally. When you generally don't fix a financial problem, it becomes worse and not better on its own. Uh, and so we've, we've got a very um, tough situation to deal with at the state level because of that. Here's a few individuals. Uh, anybody want to guess what all these gentlemen have in common? Uh, you know, if it would be two of those gentlemen, you could say they're the Billionaires Club, but uh, Willie Brown. And Anybody know who Willie Brown is? Former Speaker of the House. Dr. New over there, I'm sure, knows who Willie Brown is. Former Speaker of the House of the California Legislature. Pretty liberal guy. And, of course, you've got Bill Gates Jr. and Warren Buffett. And another clue is they aren't all begging to have their taxes raised. Just one of those gentlemen is, as far as I'm aware. Any other ideas of what they all have been looking into? Basically, they all believe that, and it's not their political party either, because I think a couple of them registered independents. They all believe that our pension system, the way that we handle pensions at the state level, is completely broken. Now, none of these gentlemen you would want to classify as a, as a right-leaning and conservative-leaning person, probably. Bill Gates might be the closest to be somewhat of a in-the-middle type person, but Warren Buffett is certainly not a low-tax type of guy, as he's been out, you know, trying to advocate to pay more himself. And Willie Brown was a very liberal member of the California legislature. You really need to be to be in California in politics. And what the three people have in common is the fact that Warren Buffett says, instead of states using this Fairy, uh, fairy tale type of 8% assumed rate of return on their pension fund assets. They had to be using something closer to 5 or 6%, which would, which would take the current liabilities as, as they're measured on the books and really blow them out of the water. 
you had Bill Gates, who not last year but the year before, I believe spent, he, I believe he, he took about a year and really wanted to study teachers' pensions and the way that we fund them and the way that it impacts public education uh, funding in, in general and the way that it impacts classroom funding. He spent a year dedicated to that topic because he thought that the fraudulent accounting in these public pension systems is a real problem for public education. And then you had Willie Brown uh, who came out, he's a columnist now for the San Francisco Chronicle, who came out and said, um, we've given away the kitchen sink and everything in state government and there's no way we can meet all the promises that we've given over the last 10 to 20 to 30 years. And this is somewhat of a, a public choice problem is, like I mentioned, politicians are short, very short term focused generally. When you're talking about politicians, generally the longest term horizon they think about is the next election cycle, right? They're always in election mode, re-election mode, whatever you have it. And when you have people making promises that are short-term promises, in, in many cases made to help their re-elections, but they're making promises with your dollars and tying them up for 30 years to, to basically make these promises that they know they're not going to be able to fulfill, that's a real problem. And that's one of the, I think that is the largest issue facing the states today. And it's clear from having these three gentlemen featured right here, this is not about Republican versus Democrat. It's not about conservative versus liberal because these are center left generally figures across the country. This is a major problem for financial reality when it comes to our states. Uh, and if we aren't able to solve this, uh, it's going to be uh, very difficult at the state level to, to regain traction. And without going too much into the, uh, I, I guess I already have ventured into the geeky uh, field of, of pensions and, and accounting a little bit, any accounting majors here? Okay, good. We've got a few. I can pick on you guys then, right? Um, so have you done, uh, I'm trying to think what courses you've probably taken, but can you explain at all um, the difference between generally private sector GAAP and GASB? Have you looked into GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, at all? Have you done a government accounting? If you haven't, that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, but I'm kind of curious to get your reactions to it because in the private sector, we have... GAP, generally accepted accounting principles that we use. Now, in the government sector, whether it comes to state or local, we don't use generally accepted accounting principles. That's the, uh, the dirty little secret when it comes to state financial issues, is we deal in our own accounting system called GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, which comes up with their own rules outside of the private sector GAP. Now, if the state and local governments had to rely on generally accepted accounting principles, there would be many public officials in jail today. There would be because of the, the difference there in what they're reporting, what they're not reporting. More importantly, they're not reporting many of these unfunded liabilities on the books in public pension systems and what they promise for health care for state workers that they don't have the money to pay for. They haven't put it on their books. And now new GASB rules are coming out to, to require more transparency to say, you know, if you've made these promises and you're telling these folks one thing, you better have the dollars there or you better reform the system to make it work for them. Uh, and that's a, it's a big problem. It's a big difference in accounting methods. Um, and so I, for the accounting students out there, I thought I would highlight that briefly. So as I mentioned, there are two sides to the fiscal coin. And I want to, in our next session, I, we're going to take a little bit of a break here in a couple of minutes. I, mean, I want to take some questions for everything we've covered so far, kind of on the spending and pension side of things. And then we're going to talk about tax policy uh, in our next session, and we're going to take a break. Um, does, but does anybody have any questions on some of the material we've covered so far? It could be federal that we've talked about. It could be some of the state issues that we've just briefly touched about or anything specific on uh, municipal finance or, or pensions or spending uh, on that side of the equation. Any questions? We have one. Yes, they do. Yeah. In fact, um, 48 of the 50 states have a constitutional or statutory requirement. Now, you can say that uh, it's, some of them are balanced budget requirements in name only, like California's. Uh, some are very loosely written, where in some states, all that is required is for you to propose a balanced budget. And then you can take it through the process and let it go wherever it may. 
but all you would have to do is prepare, <laughs> propose a balanced budget, which is pretty nice to have your accountant put it together and we'll balance it and then we'll just go on and do our business. And that's what basically California's done, where unless you create a proper balanced budget that actually has some teeth that requires revenues to meet up with expenditures, you're going to end up with the California situation. Now, what California has become very good at is, you know, there's the, um, the problem is if there's any type of looseness at all to a balanced budget requirement or to a spending restriction, politicians are pretty adept at finding it. And what California does is they put it off books, basically, and they borrow. Now, many states have a prohibition against borrowing, so they're not able to do that. But California has this, I guess you would call it a safety valve for the big spenders out there that, you know, they always have this thing they can go back to and just issue more debt. And you can take a look at California's debt levels, and it's astronomical. Uh, in, some, in some cases, I say that Greece is terrified it's going to wake up and be California someday uh, because California has issued a mountain worth of debt and they don't have the printing presses to print it off and they don't have um, you know, some of the other uh, benefits that you know, a country would have uh, to, to get the bailouts. Now, the U.S. may, they may look for a bailout from Congress uh, and that's the whole other discussion of whether that is, is uh, doable or not. It's certainly not good policy. It's a moral hazard problem, obviously, to say that we're going to bail out states that don't take care of themselves and we're going to you know, somehow reward that behavior and we're going to basically take from the states that are living within their means and doing well and give to states like California. It's a major moral hazard problem. Well, yeah, that's a great question. And this week, uh, the Treasury Secretary, uh, Tim Geithner, was asked about that. And his forecast was the next time we're going to have to raise the debt ceiling. And now, this, of course, is absent from any you know, structural reforms or spending reductions or things like that. If everything else is on autopilot, it would be, I think, January to February is the next time we'd have to have a conversation about debt ceiling again. Now, there is quite a bit of things that are scheduled to happen between this point in January or February, mostly the fact that we're having a, probably at the end of the year, what they're calling the uh, impending tax Mageddon or something like that is what the, they've been talking about, is the Bush tax cuts, which were enacted in 2001 and 2003. They were enacted, and because of some very arcane Senate rules, they were required to be phased out over a 10-year period. They were phased in, and then they would phase out at the, ten, at the end of the 10-year window. And some of that is uh, gaming the budget rules and, and kind of seeing how much the cost would be uh, to do it that way. But the, the, the bottom line is, though, that when the, they were extended briefly, um, uh, under the compromise, of course, with President Obama and the Congress, they compromised to extend the Bush tax cuts temporarily. Uh, that temporary period comes up at the end of this year. And so that discussion, I think, is going to probably have a very big effect on the debt ceiling piece of it as well. Now, if those tax cuts are allowed to expire, of course, tax rates will go up tremendously on individual income, on investment income, capital gains, and dividends, and those type of uh, issues. The death tax will be uh, raised again at the federal level. Um, but it, it may have an implication. It may push back or push forward the time of the debt ceiling negotiations. Uh, that will happen. But probably the first quarter of next year is our best guess. All right. Any other questions before we break? Um, so we want to take about a 20-minute break. Um, so we'll be back here at uh, 2.20. Does that sound about right? Uh, 2.50, right. Yep. Clock didn't update, so 2.50. We'll see you here at 2.50. Thanks, guys. Close. Yeah, a couple hours north. Yes, Michigan, Michigan native. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get uh, started here again in just a second, so if you guys could uh, finish up grabbing your refreshments, and uh, we'll get started with the second half as we get going. <clears throat> So I guess you're all here at this session uh, to learn 
why there are some why some states are rich and why some states are poor. And of course, that's one of the, the theses of our Rich States, Poor States book. And if, we were to, if I were to summarize Rich States, Poor States in one sentence, it would be, be more like Texas and less like California. Because what we have across the country, as I mentioned, we have the 50 laboratories of democracy that we can study what works and what doesn't. And it's pretty clear that what Texas is doing is working. And uh, they've, for instance, they've created something like 40% of the new jobs in this country since the 2008 crash. So in this recovery, although weak it may be, Texas has created something like 40% of all new net jobs in the entire United States. Uh, incredible when you think about that, that one state can, can do something to that degree. And of course, we, we know California's problems. Um, several years ago, they were issuing IOUs. This is not a joke. I mean, the state was actually issuing IOUs to state vendors and to uh, taxpayers. You know, when you pay your state taxes, sometimes you overpay and you get a refund. But California wasn't uh, giving out these refund checks. They were saying, yeah, we'll pay you when we have cash. Now, I wouldn't advise trying that when you owe them money, but when they owe you money, they uh, seem, to, uh, seem to be okay with it. Now, of course, that's the type of situation California was in. We know the success, of course, that Texas has realized, and we're going to talk more about that. But, you know, why are there rich states and poor states? Probably the same reason there are, um, you know, succeeding companies and failing companies. And because when you think about it, States have brands, just like companies do, and as companies do what they can to protect the value of their brand uh, and protect their reputation, states have these reputations. And unfortunately, Michigan's brand as a state is, was deeply broken for a couple of decades. Um, you know, places like New York, Illinois, Maryland, not the best brands or reputations, if you will, for businesses. Every year, um, um, the CEO magazine uh, does a ranking and they interview CEOs about the basically their reputation, the reputations of states and the, what reputation that the CEO gives to a state. And to back up my, my earlier one sentence summary of the book, they have Texas is the best state in terms of her business uh, reputation and California is the 50th. Um, and so we certainly see a pretty big differential between the states today. Um, and this next part of the presentation, I want to talk about taxes. I want to talk about the tax code. I want to talk about a little bit what good tax policy looks like and then uh, wrap it up in terms of um, what states are doing right and some of the states that are, are getting it wrong on taxes. Now, we've developed a system of um, uh, principles at ALEC, and this is something um, we've worked on for several years with our legislative members and with our members from the business community uh, about good principles of taxation. What are, you know, what's an ideal tax system look like? So first of all, we have simplicity, and that ought to be fairly straightforward in the fact that you shouldn't have a tax code that extracts wealth from the private sector in a way that's complicated. Uh, we shouldn't add that unnecessary level of cost because basically what we have is we have a tax code that's been changed uh, something like 15,000 times since the last tax reform at the federal level. And the type of deadweight loss that it causes because of people spending time and resources on you know, figuring out their tax bills and the complexity uh, is, is a major problem. It's a dead weight loss on our economy. It's a drag to our uh, businesses. It's in, you know, any of you that you know, have family businesses and seen your parents or seen their accountants go through the, uh, the multiple forms, uh, deductions, exemptions, credits, you know what type of a, a burden this can be. Transparency, uh, and that's something that um, Morris and I were talking right during the break there is as we're talking about the need for transparency, it shouldn't just be on budgets, it should be on taxes as well. And unfortunately, governments are failing on both counts. Um, and many times, as we said with the pension problem, these, these problems aren't known because they're not required. There's no required transparency for the governments to show these type of liabilities sitting on their books. And for instance, some states just assume away, you know, as they said, 8% rate of return or uh, that type of thing without much scrutiny or transparency. And then when it comes to taxes, you know, people, taxpayers have the or should have the ability to know who's taxing them and how much they're being taxed. So believe it or not, um, I, being from Michigan, I didn't really know this happened and I didn't own a business in Michigan or anything like that. But in some states, 
they actually have taxing districts. They have districts, so they have taxing authorities that can levy a sales tax or a property tax or an income tax on you as a taxpayer or a business. They have these tax districts for library districts that can tax you for different things. They have fire districts. They have water districts. They even have mosquito abatement districts in some states that have taxing authority over you as a business or an individual. So you have these multiple layers. It's not just federal. It's not just state. It's not just county or city. You have these very these sub-city organizations that have taxing power over you. And many times you just don't know, um, you know all those levels of taxes that exist. And so getting a, a better handle on the type of taxes that you face is going to be, as you, you know, a lot of you go into business and maybe start your own businesses, is something that you're going to need to have that information or you're really uh, to make informed decisions about your location. And then neutrality, this is, a, uh, this is one that party, both parties violate routinely. And that is the fact that government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. Government should be in the business of creating a neutral tax code that rewards people uh, uh, equally for like efforts, basically. You know, you shouldn't be picking winners and losers through the tax code. That ought to be left to the marketplace. That ought to be left to who's producing the most valuable new goods and services for customers. It shouldn't be government through, you know, saying, well, if you jump through this hoop, you get this tax credit. If you jump through this hoop, you get this exemption. Uh, and then businesses start behaving just based on how the tax code is written or how they perceive the tax code to be written rather than uh, maximizing long-term uh, value creation, which is something obviously that businesses ought to be doing. Um, and many times, I mean, if you have to take a look at it, I mean, you've all heard of Salandra, right? The, uh, the famous or uh, infamous government program now where, you know, government's getting in the business of basically picking winners and losers by heavily subsidizing certain businesses or certain industries or taking over certain industries. Uh, in some cases with the tax code, it's pretty pernicious at the state level where, you know, you have all these special little carve-outs that one particular industry has. Now, if you remember years back uh, when Jennifer Granholm was governor here in Michigan, they enacted, the legislature enacted a services tax, a tax on services. Now, if you remember during this debate, it ultimately lasted, I believe the tax was in existence for one weekend before they repealed it because it was so uh, unfair and hated. But if you remember how it was created, so when you're taxing services, you want to tax all final goods and services. Um, but what happened was is when they were creating it, um, the industries that had lobbyists in Lansing um, miraculously found themselves not being taxed under the service tax, while all the industries that didn't have an organized lobby presence in Lansing found themselves to be caught under the new service tax. And so, unfortunately, um, government picks winners and losers, and unfortunately, many times, uh, whoever has the strongest lobbying presence in a particular state, or D.C. in some cases, are, are able to manipulate the system if you have a system that is that malleable that it allows for all these different uh, unlike treatment based on goods and services. You want to treat all goods and services equally uh, to the extent that you can. And then when we talk with businesses, and we've got probably 300 businesses that are involved with ALEC, and some of them are Fortune 500, some of them are Fortune 50 companies, some of them are small businesses. When we talk to them, one of the things that they um, want to know when they're deciding among the 50 state locations is predictability. They want to know how predictable the system of government is going to be once they make that investment. Now, some small businesses might make a million dollar investment in one state over another, but you know, some others might make a billion dollar investment. And once you've made a billion dollar investment, you want to know pretty, you want to be pretty sure that the rules of the game aren't going to change after you've made that big investment. And so having a system of tax predictability, regulatory predictability, that things aren't going to change once investments are made, that's very important. And then finally, I would say the first four tax principles are, are, are important. They're necessary, um, but they're not sufficient on their own. You really need the final principle, uh, pro-growth tax policy. That is basically the competitiveness principle. That is, we always have to be aware that as businesses, and as governments, you don't, enact, you, don't, you don't enact changes or you don't enact decisions within a vacuum. Everything you do 
immediately affects your competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the states around you, your competitors, uh, or even locations all across the world now that capital is, is more mobile than ever and has all these different places it can go. And the old saying is capital doesn't go where it's not wanted. Uh, it's going to go to a very favorable uh, location generally, but keeping in mind the competitiveness principle is key whenever we're talking about tax policy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we were going to talk about the Laffer curve in economics. Now, any of you, uh, this may be, you may be a little too young for this, but every, any of you watched uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Anybody a fan of that? Oh, okay, good. Well, we got a lot of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So, you remember the famous line in Ben Stein, it's voodoo economics, right? And so that, that was what he was talking about was the Laffer curve on the chalkboard when he was giving his economics lecture, and uh, he gave the, the famous line. Of course, that came from then Vice President uh, George H.W. Bush when he was debating Ronald Reagan for the presidential nomination. It would have been then uh, pre-Vice President stage for H.W. Bush. But the point of the matter is, is when Laffer was coming up with this concept, and you know, he tells the story very, very well, but at a 0% tax rate, how much economic activity is there going to be? There's going to be a lot. So how much tax revenue is going to be, though, at a 0% uh, tax rate? That's the easy half of the equation. Now, on the other side of the equation, at 100% marginal tax rate, how much revenue are you going to raise for government? Zero, right? Because is anybody going to work for the privilege of paying taxes? No, because you have this trade-off between work and leisure, like I talked about earlier. And if once marginal tax rates and that disincentive to work gets to a particular point, people are going to start not working. They're going to start choosing leisure or spending time with their family or going on vacation rather than working if they're only able to keep a certain amount of their money. Now, um, Ronald Reagan knew this firsthand because he was a movie actor before he got into politics and made a lot of money at that in Hollywood, uh, not as much as they do now. But you know, he would tell the story to um, you know, he would tell it to the media or he'd tell it to his, uh, his family. He said, you know, once I get to the 90% tax bracket, I stopped making movies because it wasn't worth my effort, it wasn't worth my time as much as I enjoyed doing it. You know, people aren't built that way. That's not human nature. Um, and, of course, John F. Kennedy came along and was really one of the first supply-side presidents where he cut marginal tax rates from over 90% down to about 75%. So he was a, a big tax, that was a big tax cut. It was on the top income level. So in today's vernacular in DC, he would be a tax cutter for the top 1%. Um, but you know, he was a Democrat that believed in growth and believed in you know, when you reduce marginal tax rates, people have incentive to work more, invest more, um, have more economic production, and you actually realize uh, not the full loss of revenue that you would under a, uh, most people would say tax cuts cost uh, that full amount of money. That's not the case when you have more economic growth. That's what the Laffer curve uh, shows. But it's very uh, difficult. It's been ridiculed now for you know 30 years, but it's very difficult to disprove the theory of the Laffer curve. Is basically it shows that people's behavior changes based on high marginal tax rates. And so depending where you are on the curve, you're going to see a different type of economic growth effect and a different type of revenue effect. But the bottom line is people don't work for the privilege of paying taxes. Now, we have uh, something we've talked about in, uh, in academics for probably now 60 years, uh, beginning with uh, Charles Thibault and some others, talking about the concept of how Americans vote with their feet since we have these 50 different locations that we get to decide you know, where we locate or whatnot, there's a lot of different advantages that some states have over others. Uh, some states have beautiful beaches. Some states have you know, really cold winters. Some states don't have winters. Some states like Washington don't see the sunshine. Uh, and so, I mean, we have a lot of different things going on. But the concept is, is that Americans now for decades have voted with their feet and they vote based on their relative preferences, uh, whether they like to go to states with high taxes and high government service or more government services, or low taxes and lower government services, or in the case that I think that Morris and I would probably make is there are a lot of low tax states that have effective government services that don't cost as much. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have the trade-off between high services, high taxes, low, serv uh, low taxes, and low services. There is a, a more ideal point that I think many states have started to realize. But the fact of the matter is, is last time I checked, there was about 
six and a half million Americans that decided to move uh, the last year or so, depending on uh, census numbers, what year you use. But the fact of the matter is millions of Americans do move every year from state to state. And it's kind of interesting to kind of see where people are moving because these are displayed, revealed preferences, we like to call them, in economics, where people decide to move. There, there's probably uh, some lessons to be learned of why they're moving to a certain location and why they're leaving certain locations. So if you take a look, um, and Christmas comes early uh, every year for tax uh, and demographic geeks such as myself because the Census uh, Bureau usually um, puts out these numbers right before Christmas time and they the last year this was a big deal in a lot of the states and also in Congress because every 10 years we redraw all of the congressional seats called redistricting and reapportionment is what we do every 10 years based on the census. So this basically consumed many of the states this year and how they're going to redraw the lines for their Congress and for their own seats. And so a lot of business didn't get done this year because people were so concerned about redrawing lines. And so their redrawing of lines all is based on census numbers. And here are the states that have been seeing the most uh, migration to their state over the last uh, 10 years. And in parentheses, those, that's the ranking system that we assign the states in rich states, poor states on their economic outlook, basically how free market their policies are. And so you can see the states that have gained the most population over the last 10 years, uh, many of those states are some very, very pro-free market states. In fact, none of those states that have gained the most have been in the bottom half of competitiveness in our rankings. The states with the highest out-migration there you have it. Michigan, unfortunately, is still in the states with the highest out-migration. Michigan moved up this year in our rankings, up to 17, because of some things that were done in the last year. And I'll talk about some of that in the recent uh, changes section. But you, know, you see Illinois, for instance, uh, New York, California, New Jersey, many of the usual suspects that you would consider very high-tax uh, states falling in the area that have lost population over the last decade. Now, here is the Census Bureau map of population in terms of congressional seats by state. And the states in dark blue are the states that have lost or have gained uh, congressional seats in this last 10 years. And the states in the light blue have lost congressional seats over the last 10 years. Anybody uh, remember uh, reading about any states that gained the most? Um, there's a state in particular that gained four congressional seats in the last 10 years because of all the population. Texas, exactly right. Texas gained four congressional seats, which is incredible in a 10-year period. I mean, they gain more congressional seats than many states have in their entire congressional delegation. A lot of states only have you know, one to two members of the United States House. So Florida also gained multiple seats. They gained two seats. And then the states that lost the most, Michigan lost one, again, for now I believe the second or third decade in a row. Um, New York lost two congressional seats, and Ohio lost two congressional seats. Those are the only states to lose multiple seats. Now, what I will point out is a state that neither gained nor lost seats probably tells us about as much as you need to know about migration, and that is the state of California. Now, this is the first time since state, the state was founded in the early uh, the mid-1800s that California will not gain a congressional seat in this round of redistricting. Now that's something to be said because you've had this long history of California being a growth state. And at one point, if California was a nation, I think it would have been the eighth largest economy or the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, that was how strong of a growth they were. People were flocking to California you know, for you know, the last 150 years. Why has California stopped growing? That's an important question. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because some of the critics uh, out there will say that people just move to states based on weather and that taxes don't matter and that business climates don't matter and uh, you know that's that's something that they try to argue is that weather is the only thing that matters and obviously California disproves that since it's one of the most beautiful uh, states uh, in, the, in the nation. Now this is a 10-year view that we just saw. Let's take a, a look back a little bit further. Let's go back 50 years. So since 1960 here are the states that have lost the most in terms of congressional seats. Now, just roughly, congressional seats are about 700,000 people today, roughly. So over the last 50 years, Michigan's lost five on net. 
But you look at places like Ohio lost eight, Pennsylvania lost nine, New York has lost 14 congressional seats over the last 50 years. Now, winters in upstate New York aren't nice, but you know they're not nice in a lot of these places uh, that have lost a lot fewer seats in New York. I mean, uh, it's, it's very interesting in how a state like that has just gone off the competitiveness map over the last 50 years, and it's a state that still has Wall Street. Can you imagine if the banks and, and the other financial institutions of Wall Street had left New York? Um, we would be a much more drastic uh, drop off than that. But I think that tells you something that it's not just the Midwest that's uh, you know the Rust Belt, if you will. I think the Rust Belt now extends up into New England, and I think you can draw quite a few uh, comparisons between some of the policies of the Upper Midwest and the policies of New England that have probably had some you know, degree of influence over this population. Uh, now, as I mentioned, there's some folks um, out there that will try to tell you that taxes and other policies don't influence business decisions and don't influence the migration of people from one state to another. Now, a couple of the places that I've been to over the last year that I never wanted to really leave uh, after I'd been there, Hawaii and California. Now, let's take a look at it. Now, if it was all based on weather and that people just moved to one location or another because of better winters, obviously Michigan has a long experience with snowbirds that go down to Florida and some of them never come back because they like it. Um, you know, th there's certainly uh, something to be said that weather has an influence. People being close proximity to their family has influence, obviously. Many things matter for why people move. But when you look at it on its face, you know, some of the nicest beaches, some of the nicest places, the question remains, why has Hawaii lost population eight out of the last 10 years? Why have more Americans decided to leave Hawaii and go to one of the other 49 states? And a lot of it, in California as well, has a net loss of over a million and a half Americans over the last decade. Why are people leaving these places? Because they're expensive. You know, cost of living is a big factor. Taxes certainly add to the cost of living, but also people generally go where the jobs are. Uh, and that's what we find in our research in rich states, poor states, is that that is a very good way of answering the question of, you know, why are people moving? They go where the jobs are, and that's why they're going to places like Texas. And it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense from, from an economics perspective as well. One of the things we isolate in rich states, poor states that I think has a big factor uh, is the states that can avoid a personal income tax. So basically today we have a system where 41 of the states have personal income taxes, nine do not. And what we do is uh, we isolate out those nine states without personal income taxes and we compare them with the nine states that have the highest personal income taxes at the state level. And so on that group of high tax states, their state tax is about, uh, state and local tax averages almost 10%, which is incredible because, I mean, you're thinking about you're paying in the 20s or maybe 35, 30 uh, federal rate, plus almost 10% in many of these states. And in some states, like Hawaii, has the highest in the nation at 11% personal income tax, and that's just a state tax. So let's take a look at how the no income tax states fared versus the states with the highest income tax rates. So one of the metrics we use is gross state product growth. Over the last 10 years, the highest uh, st income tax states, it saw a little over 42% GSP uh, growth. The no income tax states though saw almost 60% gross state product growth. So you see a big growth premium there just in the gross domestic product uh, from the states. And that's just a 10 year period. To say that you've grown you know, almost 20 percentage points greater uh, over a 10-year period is a big, uh, big deal for the no-income tax states. Population growth, as I mentioned, people are voting with their feet. Let's see how it, it plays out with the, the high-income tax states versus the no-income tax states. About 5.5% population growth in the states with high-income taxes. The states with no-income taxes, 13.65% population growth. So it's pretty clear, based on the choices that people have out there today, that people are moving and voting pretty heavily with their feet in order to move to the states with the no, no income tax or some of the lower tax rates out there. Now, you take a look at total tax receipt growth, because this could be something that folks that support higher tax could say, well, if you avoid a personal income tax, how in the world are you ever going to pay for state government? 
So let's look at how the states fared in the tax receipt growth category. It's about 45% tax receipt growth in the states with the highest income taxes over the last decade. But look at that. How about that? It's almost 82% receipt growth in the states with no income taxes. Now, this creates a little bit of a challenge to those who feel that you need high income taxes to raise the enough revenue to fund state government. Because clearly, almost two to one growth in the states without income taxes of tax revenues. Now, why is this? Now, some of the states without income taxes have natural resources. They're rich in natural resources like Wyoming and Alaska, those being the two that depend most on severance tax or what they call severance taxes is what uh, they charge people for extracting resources. So you, that plays somewhat of a role in it. But I think the larger point is that when the most sustainable way to raise tax revenue is by not raising tax rates, but by broadening your tax base and by attracting more taxpayers to your state. So Texas has seen strong growth in state tax revenue, although they don't have an income tax. But when you gain, they gain four congressional seats, remember, that's 700,000 a pop, roughly. So they've gained a couple of million new residents in that state over the last 10 years. And while those new residents aren't paying income taxes, they're paying state sales taxes, they're paying property taxes, and they're paying the other forms of revenue that raise uh, money for state government. And that's really the key. That's really the Laffer curve in action as well, is when you have a competitive system at the state level, you attract more businesses, you attract more entrepreneurs, more uh, value creators to your state, you create more value in your state and you have a larger tax base that you are able to draw on. And then finally, this has been the topic of discussion across every state over the last couple of years, and that is how do you create jobs? Now, first of all, of course, it's not government's place to create jobs, and they don't do a very good job at creating jobs. Uh, that's, you know, that's something that the private sector does. Uh, government, of course, doesn't create wealth, so it's impossible for them to create jobs. They're redistributing uh, wealth from private sector to the government sector. Uh, you may see a, a short-term you know, government job created, but the money that was needed to be extracted from the private sector in order to fund that government job has, you know, has been taken out of the private sector and put to the government sector, and so there's really no new net uh, value creation happening. And that's really the problem, as you can say, you know, hey, we created, you know, a thousand jobs for fixing this road down here, so maybe we ought to have broken roads more more often, right? Because we're creating jobs. The problem is, is if you, you know, you're not creating value, anything inherent within the government, you're redistributing it from the private sector, taking it out of the productive sector, and putting it into the government sector. That, of course is why uh, when famously asked, you know, what about government stimulus, you know, it was a, uh, they were, it was a system where um, it was, I believe it was Milton Friedman in Hong Kong was the famous example or, or someplace in Asia when he was um, asking, you know, them why they were using um, you know, shovels to dig a trench instead of having uh, big machinery or equipment. And they were like, well, it's a stimulus program. We need to create jobs. And then he famously retorted, well, if your goal was to create jobs, you know, you ought to be using uh, toothpicks instead of uh, shovels because obviously, you know, that's the fallacy of government, you know, just doesn't create wealth. It doesn't create jobs. It can't. It has to take it out of the productive private sector. And then, like I mentioned, job growth in the, in the high income tax states, negative job growth over the last 10 years. And then in the no income tax states, it's almost like, you know, what recession happened over the last decade. They've just cruised through this very difficult business cycle and still averaged 5.36% uh, job growth over the last decade. You can't even calculate a percentage difference when you have a negative number here. It makes it a little difficult, but saying that you had uh, that type of a positive job growth over this difficult decade is, uh, is really saying something. Now, I should make the uh, talk just for a second in that obviously some tax, uh, taxes aren't created equally. There are some taxes that are more damaging than others to economic growth. And what we've isolated out and what many academics have isolated out for years is you want to avoid taxing capital. You want to avoid taxing those mobile factors, as I mentioned. 
in our uh, golden rules of tax policy from the uh, from the book. And so, what about the other forms of taxes that you really do need to raise government revenue in some form? So, what do you need to use? Um, and all taxes, you know, should be pointed out. Also, all taxes do damage uh, economic growth to some extent or another because they are taking wealth from the pr productive private sector. So uh, let's take a look at sales taxes because when you look at the states, basically uh, state income taxes and state sales taxes are the two major forms of revenue for states to, to raise government uh, support. Now let's see if sales taxes have the same relationship that income taxes do when it comes to growth. So what we do is we measure the states with the highest sales tax burden and then measure the states with the lowest sales tax burden and take a, year, uh, take a decade's worth of economic growth data from those states to, uh, to see the difference, to see if there's that premium that exists. So let's once again look at gross state product growth over the last 10 years. The states with the highest uh, sales tax burden, 55% GSP growth. The states with the lowest sales tax burden, a little bit better, not significantly, but 48% growth. Population growth. The states with the highest sales tax burden saw a pretty respectable, over 10% population growth over the last decade. The states with the lowest sales tax burden, still pretty respectable, 8% uh, growth over the last decade. And then job growth. We saw about 3% job growth in the states with the highest sales tax burden and about 2% in the lowest burden. So you can see there with the sales tax category, the, you do have the effect on growth. It's just not nearly exagger as exaggerated as the, uh, the income tax effect because all taxes do matter, just some matter more than others. And in our research, the states uh, that avoid income taxes do much better than the states that have zero sales tax or uh, low sales taxes. Now, anybody know how many states don't tax sales at all? It's, uh, there's nine states that don't tax personal income. How many would you guess don't tax sales? It's less. It's less than nine. Three, four. No, it's five. Five states don't tax sales. It's kind of interesting to see because generally when states don't tax sales, they actually have much higher income taxes because they want to make up that revenue somehow. And sometimes when states don't tax income, they have higher sales taxes to make up the difference. Or then there's some states, believe it or not, New Hampshire. Anybody here from New Hampshire? Okay, so New Hampshire is the live free or die state, right? Uh, that's their motto. They take it pretty seriously, too. I'll tell you, I've taken quite a few trips up to Concord, testified before the legislature a couple of times. It's an interesting group of people. Uh, they have neither an income tax nor a sales tax in New Hampshire. That's their commitment to limited government. And the way that they're able to make it work, because you would think, oh gosh, well, if they don't have a sales tax or they don't have an income tax, how could they pave roads? How could they have schools? How could they you know, do anything as a state government? But the fact of the matter is, New Hampshire does a pretty good job in terms of their educational attainment and educational outcomes. They have fine roads. They have a lot of really um, you know, decent attributes as a state without taxing income or sales. Now, they do that because they keep government generally limited. Now, if you keep government limited enough, you don't need to rely heavily on some of these sources of revenue because New Hampshire is not a big energy state. You know, you don't have huge coal and oil and natural gas production like you do in some of the no-income tax states. But New Hampshire is able to do uh, be basically keep its live for your die uh, mentality alive and its, its reputation alive by keeping government limited enough. Uh, funny story, and I'll uh, I'll get back on the subject right after this. But when it comes to New Hampshire, they actually don't have offices for their legislators. If you're a senator or a representative from the state of New Hampshire, you don't have an office. What you have is a locker. Think eighth grade. You have an eighth grade style locker as your office as a state legislator. You know how much they make. You know Michigan legislators. What do they make now? Sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, with more than that, with with good benefits. What do you think the average, what do you think the legislators in New Hampshire make? Any guesses? 30,000? 30, well, it's, it's good. It's lower than Michigan, but it's a lot lower than 30,000. Lower than 20. Well, it's not quite nothing, but you're closer than anybody else. It was $100 a year 
is that is their salary to be a legislator from New Hampshire. So they're basically a voluntary citizen legislature, um, and that's how one of the ways they're able to do it uh, is able to keep a no income tax, no sales tax state. They cut costs where other states don't dare. And sometimes, as you can imagine, as being an organization of state legislators, when I talk about how New Hampshire does it and suggest that, well, they only make $100 a year, you can imagine the reaction I get from a lot of the other state legislators who are making, you know, 60, 70, 80, $100,000 a year. So let's re-examine uh, one other factor, and we compare the states with the highest corporate income taxes to the states with, uh, with the lowest corporate income taxes. And some, some states, several states, don't have corporate income taxes. Um, and then, uh, so the average top rate of corporate income taxes in the category of the low tax states here is 2.5%. And the, uh, the average tax rate in the states with the highest corporate income taxes in the country now is almost 12%. That's the biggest, that's the difference that we have on corporate income taxes across the country. Gross state product growth, once again, a little under 50% over the last 10 years in the high corporate income tax states. It's almost 60% in the states with the lowest corporate income taxes. Population growth, uh, almost 7% in the states with highest corporate rates almost 12% in the states with the lowest corporate income taxes. And then tax receipt growth, 57.87 to almost 70%. So you see a pretty strong premium once again with the states that have the lowest uh, corporate income tax rates. Here's the job growth numbers, almost zero uh, net job growth in the states with the highest corporate income taxes, almost 5%. So very strong job growth in the states with the lowest corporate taxes. Um, one of the objections, of course, is to getting rid of business taxes or talking about reducing taxes on entrepreneurs, job creators, is the fact that some people out there will say, some of the more progressive um, people or folks on the, on the political left would say, that you can't shift tax burdens away from businesses and put them onto individuals. Sometimes they make that argument. Now, we have said this time and time again in rich states, poor states, you know, being a student, Northwood student that you are, you get the Wall Street Journal, I'm sure, and you read that every day, cover to cover. And the Wall Street Journal talks about this all the time, is that businesses don't pay taxes, people do. And you may have to just step back and think about that for a minute, because sometimes when I give this presentation to business owners themselves, and when I say businesses don't pay taxes, they get a little bit bristled because of that. You know, they, they don't like that very well. But when you walk them through the exercise, they get it. So here's, here's basically the exercise is that when a business makes money, they pay probably quarterly filings to the IRS. So yes, they pay legally, they pay taxes. They have checks that they cut to the IRS. That's a tax paid from that business. And you're like, well, wait a minute, Williams, you just said businesses don't pay taxes. But I think the larger economic question is who really pays the burden of the tax levied on business? That is a question that conservative, moderate, and sometimes even liberal economists agree on that say businesses don't pay taxes, people do. Because how does a business as an entity pay a tax? That would be like saying how a um, you know, projector pays a tax. It's not capable of doing that as a business entity because what are businesses? They're made up of people. And what we have is we have three groups of people that ultimately pay any tax levied on a business. So businesses will either you know, charge more for their products. So you don't know, for instance, and this is a very bad way of taxing because we go back to the principles of taxes. You want transparent taxes, right? The problem with business taxes is we know that they're not borne by businesses. They're actually paid by individuals. We're just not exactly sure which group of individuals pays them. So for instance, when you're drinking your, um, your Coca-Cola there, do you know how much corporate taxes are embedded in that particular price of Coca-Cola? I don't know. Dr. Matrick doesn't know. He's a pretty smart guy. You know, we, nobody knows because it changes all the time, but we do know the fact that business taxes are embedded in the price of goods of what you buy. You just don't know based on what kind of good, where you buy it. There's a lot of other factors, elasticity factors as to you know, what type of a tax is included when you buy a case of Coca-Cola. 
but it's there. We all know that as economists. The other group is investors. When you're investing in a 401k for your retirement, when if you're working for government, when they're investing for you, as we talked about in the pension funds in, in uh, the market, when a company gets taxed, it passes it on sometimes to investors in a lower rate of return on their investment. And then finally, what I think the most recent research coming out of the U.S. Treasury, the Congressional Budget Office, and other uh, academic institutions suggests is that among the groups of individuals that pay business taxes, workers pay the most in terms of when a company is taxed. Generally, uh, I, I think some of the statistics that I've seen is about two-thirds of business taxes fall on workers in the form of lower wages, fewer jobs created, and maybe not getting a raise like you hoped you were going to get as an employee. So it's important when we're talking about taxing business that we don't fall into the trap of saying, well, businesses don't pay their fair share. We need to stick it to businesses more and more because at the end of the day, when you walk through the economics 101 of it, is that people are paying these business taxes. We just don't know exactly who, but we know that people are paying the tax. And as I talked about with these previous three slides, we looked at personal income tax, corporate income tax, and sales tax. And we took a look at all the states that had the lower tax rates or burdens performed better, but it, it, we had more of a growth premium with the personal income tax and the corporate income tax. Another argument I usually make with state policymakers and that why avoiding income taxes is a good idea uh, for not only states but all, all levels of government is the fluctuation of the tax revenue. So the most stable source of tax revenue when you're taxing something is going to be a consumption tax, something that has a very broad base in a low rate. So when you have a boom and bust cycle, and you know, we all know it's going to come, there's this business cycle, we're, we're, we don't exactly know where we are all the time on the business cycle, but we do know the, the next boom and the next bust is going to happen eventually. When that happens, you know, you can see here the white line, I don't know how well you can see it, but the white line here that has the biggest rise and fall, that's corporate income taxes. So companies get very profitable during the good times. So you can see, you know, about 2005 here when things were really heating up, 2006, you know, corporate profits were pretty good. And then they fell off. I mean, they took a nosedive there. So by 2008, um, they were in awful shape. So that's the most volatile source of revenue at the state level. Personal income taxes are the blue line there, which you can also see follows the business cycle and in a way had a deeper fall off than corporate income taxes did after the 2008 crash. And then you can see the gray line, the sales tax revenue. While it does follow the general pattern of the economy, it doesn't have nearly the fluctuation that the others do. And so as we talk at the state level, we have to balance budgets. So when it comes to creating and, and selecting a tax, that has the most attributes based on what we think good tax policy looks like, predictability is awfully key when it comes to budget writing. And it, it's very clear from the data now since 1998 to the present that taxes on capital are the most volatile as well uh, based on economic conditions. And so purely from a public finance perspective, even if you take away you know, our belief in the Northwood idea of free enterprise and what good competitive business policy looks like, even if you just take a very myopic view of it to say, um, you know, what is good public finance, um, you ought to go towards a consumption tax and away from taxing capital. Now, as I promised, um, in the Rich States, Poor States book, every year we do the ranking of the states based on 15 equally weighted factors. And these are taxes, their regulation, and their labor policy. And every year we come up with the 1 through 50 ranking where 1's the best, 50's the worst. And this year, with the new edition that just came out, here are the top 10 states. Utah, believe it or not, this is getting a little bit embarrassing. Utah has been number one for all five editions of the book that we've done. I'm, in fact, I'm getting kind of tired of giving it to Utah every year. I go out to Salt Lake City, do an event with the governor. He does a press release, gets to brag about it. I'd really like to see they get some competition here pretty soon. Uh, but they get things right. Utah has done some very good things. They enacted pension reform a couple of years ago. They're ahead of the curve there. They um, have cut their tax rates down. They created a flat tax. They used to be a graduated uh, tax rate structure. They're a flat tax structure now. Uh, South Dakota is a state without an income tax. 
Virginia, my new home state, uh, is a state that's done quite well. Of course, Virginia benefits somewhat because it's close to the, uh, the Washington, D.C. area. Now, you could say that uh, you don't see Maryland, for instance, though, in the top ten, and they benefit just as much or more from the federal government than Washington or than Virginia does. Um, they are in the 20 range because of their uh, poorer policies than Virginia. And then to round up the top five, Wyoming, a no-income tax state, and also then North Dakota. Anybody been following the news and what's going on in North Dakota with the big oil play uh, up there? It's incredible. I mean, some of the uh, people I've talked to from North Dakota, um, they say the construction boom just to house workers because people are coming in, there's no place for these people to live, so they're building these temporary housing um, up there just so they can accommodate workers to come work in the industry. It's incredible. I mean, the hotels are jammed. They can't build hotels fast enough. People are, are just going there in droves, and North Dakota is becoming a very competitive state. They're cutting taxes along the way. They've got the extra revenue coming in. And as of last week, I believe North Dakota became the U.S. Uh, it's the second largest oil producing state in the United States which is incredible after Alaska that it surpassed some of the other states out there. That's the type of oil boom that they're realizing right now. And then the, the bottom 10 states, New York is 50th out of 50 for the fourth time out of five years. Now, I was once concerned about New York because they lost their 50th out of 50 and went down to 49 one year, but then promptly got it back again because they kept raising taxes and, and increasing costs of doing business in New York. Vermont um, is 49. Illinois now, as I mentioned, uh, in the Midwest, really taking a nosedive. They raised taxes by 67% last year towards the start of their session. They've seen businesses um, move out because of that. Uh, in fact, many have moved to Wisconsin. We have actually have a section in this year's Rich States, Poor States talking about the case study of Wisconsin versus Illinois and how both states have some very similar things that they've gone through as states, uh, the very close proximity, obviously, sharing quite a large border, but how Wisconsin's approach to things has been vastly different than Illinois. You, know, you had a reformer-type governor of Scott Walker come in and raise a, a few eyebrows with some of the things that he was able to do, but he did some very pro-taxpayer reforms to set Wisconsin back on more solid footing than they had been, while Illinois took a very different approach, raised taxes, as I mentioned, and now seeing businesses uh, flee the state. Uh, Maine and Hawaii round up the, uh, the worst five there, uh, and then you can see kind of a trend, if you will. Some of the New England states seem to be clustered in here together, being the bottom ten. You can see New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Vermont, and Maine all falling in the bottom ten. Now, one thing I did want to mention is, you know, we have basically now well over 200 years of experience in studying the 50 states, uh, studying the 50 laboratories of democracy, trying to see what works and what doesn't. And from, from, our, ex from our observation over the last 10 years especially, but over the last half century worth of data that we have pretty reliable data, it's pretty clear that Americans, when given the choice, you know, choose the states that value free enterprise, choose the states that keep costs of business low, keep taxes low, keep regulations reasonable, and live within their means. Uh, and that's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to refute based on the data. Now, some people, as I mentioned, say weather matters more than any of those factors. I thought we probably did a pretty good, good job disproving it. But just in case, um, you know, I haven't found yet in all my trips to the states this magic weather machine that state legislators miraculously have somewhere that they can change their, their seven-day forecast or change their outlook as a state to have 80-degree winter days. Uh, it's just not such a thing for states to do. Uh, I haven't found it yet, uh, and uh, so I think it's awfully important when we're talking about how good policy is made to focus on things that we can actually have an impact over, and that is things like taxes, regulation, labor policies, and that's why we've decided to focus on those things in our uh, publication, Rich States, Poor States. I would say, you know, we have the beauty of the American experiment to see what works and what doesn't. As I mentioned, I think states, are, in a way, are 
moving in two directions. There's almost a balkanization effect between the 50 states where you have the states that are trying to become more competitive even in difficult climates that we've had over the last 10 years and we have the states that say it doesn't matter let's throw caution to the wind and let's just keep raising taxes and spending. So I think we have you know based on the kind of the tax and spend case study of, of New England and some of the Midwestern states like uh, Illinois and we have more or less the free enterprise type uh, climate that we have in Texas and some of the states that are doing very well. Now one thing that I would mention also that I really want to leave you with is one of the things that we found over the years is when states get it wrong on taxes and when they start raising the cost of doing business in their states, they do realize the laws, that they all, laws of economics still apply. So businesses have that pressure to leave. They feel the pressure on their bottom line and the states with high tax rates do feel the consequences uh, because of outmigration and the others. One of the things that states do when they become anti-free enterprise is they start getting in the business of trying to give special deals. And this is what we saw, and this is what I like to call cronyism. Um, you could call it crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is when government gets in the business of dictating business, it's a pretty dangerous position to get in because obviously it raises a lot of questions of corruption. You know, why is government picking this company over its competitor? Why is it picking this industry over that industry for special favorite treatment? Um, now, this is the case of Illinois. As I mentioned, they raised taxes in a very large way last year, and there's a couple companies there that you probably all recognize. Of course, Sears, Sears and Roebuck is based in Illinois, and so is the, uh, the Mercantile Exchange. And if you have read some of the news stories coming out of Illinois since the tax increase, you know what they did was they offered special incentives to those two companies specifically to keep them in the state of Illinois because they realized that these companies were facing Economics 101. They were facing the competitive pressures from, from their uh, competitor, competitor companies and from states across the country where their competitors were enjoying an advantage with the lower cost of operating in those states. So, for instance, when I was in Austin, Texas this year, the Chamber of Commerce was pretty excited that they were going to get Sears and Roebuck to come down and move to Texas to take advantage of their cost savings. But what Illinois did to, in a way, compete uh, in, a, in a cronious type way is what Illinois did was give Sears and Roebuck a special little handout to say, we're going to give you this much in tax-free income over the next, I don't know, three to five years. And, you know, Sears and Roebuck making a business decision given that offer, you know, we can't probably blame them for taking it because they've got a lot of investments in Illinois. It does, there is a cost of transition to when you pick up and move. There's a lot of uh, things that you need to uh, spend money on to do that. They decided to stay and so did the CME group. The Mercantile Exchange decided to stay in Illinois after they got this special tax treatment. But, you know, I think the point is, is that we have two separate visions, and, and Thomas Sowell says it very well. It's a conflict of visions, as he pointed out in his book. We have the free enterprise vision in the states that appear to be doing quite well without a whole lot of government intervention, and we have, the, uh, the, in a way, the high-tax, cronyist version of competitiveness. But nonetheless, these states still are competing. They're just competing in a way that I think is very counterproductive and is bad public policy. Um, and so I think you know, the states give us a real window into free enterprise and the, the generally the, se the success record that free enterprise enjoys in the states that, that actually put it to use versus the states that um, you know, do not and, and don't really care about free enterprise. Now, next week on Capitol Hill, I'll be speaking on a, an event with uh, Senator uh, Rand Paul and a couple of others uh, talking about uh, the title of our uh, Hill event is going to be uh, poor nation, rich states, and what can Washington learn from the states? And unfortunately, the way that we're moving in Washington is we're moving much more along the lines of the failed uh, tax and spend approach that has not worked in the states, uh, and we're not moving towards the free enterprise approach. As I mentioned, we've got a huge competitive de deficit because of taxes, because of bad regulations, and I think that uh, you know my organization, ALEC, exists to follow the trends in the 50 states, and if we really do believe in this system of federalism, a system where you know, we do have still some state autonomy and states still do have authority to basically create their own futures in, in some extent, you know, we have to be pretty aware of the data that we just went through to say, you know, when given the chance, 
free enterprise does work. And since we do have these laboratories, it works pretty well, and we have that background. Um, now, when it comes to federalism, that's almost a topic for an entire another discussion. But once upon a time, there was such a thing known as the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Anybody here know the Tenth Amendment uh, by any chance? Unfortunately, not a lot of people do. And in fact, you're not alone. Most members of Congress don't probably know what the Tenth Amendment is, uh, or they don't. Or they choose not to know what it is, because in it, you know the Tenth Amendment, when the founders put together our system, basically said all powers not given expressly to the federal government are reserved for the states or the people of the states, because they wanted to create this system where. The states had authority. The federal government was going to be very limited in the ability, the powers that it was given from the founders, and that the states and the local governments, the units of government closest to the people, and I will say most responsive to the people, would be given more authority. Now, let me tell you, in my experience working with state legislators, if you have an issue that you contact your state legislator about, it will take about two to three, four calls before that office is very concerned about a particular issue. When they start hearing the phone ring from two or three or four people talking about a particular issue, they take notice and they start asking their staff, you know, what in the world's going on with this? Let's, let's get to the bottom here. Now, who here thinks that your member of Congress, when they hear from two or three people, are going to take it seriously and actually make a policy difference because of the people that are contacting them? It doesn't happen. You know, you might get a form letter back if you're lucky, an email maybe from one of their staff assistants that gives you a uh, pre-typed, uh, pre-canned response. But I think, you know, our experience is government works best that governs closest to the people. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things I want to leave you with is as you're going out into the workforce, you know, maybe you're close to graduating this year, maybe you're graduating next year, maybe it's going to be a couple of years. But as you're going out to the workforce, you're going to be hopefully in the business world. Hopefully you're going to be out there creating the jobs, doing the things that are going to keep this, get this economy rolling again. But you're going to be confronted with, you know, some choices. You're going to be confronted with, you know, how active of a role do I want to have in civic government as a, as a business owner or as an employee in the private sector. And I encourage you, you know, as you take a look at what works and what doesn't, we need more of our elected officials to know from people that understand business, that know from people that understand economics 101. Uh, and that's a very important point because so many times elected officials, all they hear from is folks that have never been in a business class, that have never understood or taken an economics or financial management type class and understand how things work. But you're a little bit unique coming from Northwood. You know, you've learned the Northwood idea. You've learned some of the principles of business. You learned some of the principles of economics that are so important in today's uh, political arena today, but are too often neglected. And so my, my uh, urge to you, one thing I want you to take away from this is be politically active. And I don't care what candidate you support. But, I, you know, be out there telling people your experience from the business community. Because if we're not serious about getting input from job creators, entrepreneurs, and people that understand business, how in the world are we ever going to create jobs and get our economy back going, whether it's the state economy or the national economy? In fact, if I, you know, if I will be so blunt, I don't think we have any lawyers here probably, but if we, had got, if we were able to get rid of every lawyer in elected office and replace it with somebody that has business experience as a small businessman, as an entrepreneur, this country would be worlds ahead of where we're at today. And so I leave you to say, please be involved. Uh, you know, take advantage of the Northwood experience. Learn from uh, some of the great professors that will teach you about uh, economics and some of the business background. But, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure being with you today. Uh, I, I appreciate your attention, and uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, we're going to have some time here for questions. Uh, we'll get, let you out a little bit early, but I would like to answer any of the questions that you have. And I'm sure covering all the material that we have in such a short amount of time, you probably will have quite a few questions. Um, can I start? Sorry. Um, one of the issues that's uh, been important to the Midwest recently is this right to work. And I know it's kind of outside your specialty. But, uh, you know, the labor policies, Indiana recently passed uh, right to work legislation, and there was some talk in Michigan about whether or not we would pursue that. 
And so far, our, our governor has said, well, that's not something we want to deal with. But there's been, a, you know, kind of a, a wellspring of support for that. So uh, could you talk a little bit about whether or not you found that makes a significant difference in the competitive position of the state? That's, that's a big question. You're right. And it, we do deal with that significantly in rich states, poor states. In fact, out of our 15 factors that we measure the state competitiveness levels like we do, right to work is one of the 15 factors because we do, we do think it makes a pretty big difference. And in, as you alluded to there, Indiana, uh, neighbors to the south, became the first state north of the Mason-Dixon, east of the Mississippi, ever to become a right to work state just this year. Uh, and that was done. Uh, under Governor Mitch Daniels, who after the week of it passing, uh, says that there were many companies calling up the state's economic development office to say, you know, how can we come and uh, participate in Indiana now and expand into Indiana because of this change. And like I said, we work with, you know, hundreds of companies across the country, and many of them will say that right to work is a binary for them. It's either yes or no. If a state is a right-to-work state, it's in consideration. Now, it may not end up getting the plant because, you know, there's a lot of other factors like taxes and, and other regulations and things like that that matter. But if it's not a right-to-work state, many of the companies say it gets tossed out of the list uh, right off the top of the bat. Now, Indiana, it was a controversial issue in Indiana. It would certainly be a controversial issue here in Michigan, and the governor knows that, and that's, I'm sure, why he's, uh, he's come out that way. Um, so it, it does matter. We look at, there's a, about 50-50 in terms of states that are right-to-work states and states that are not. So we have a pretty good way of measuring, and there's really been no changes except for Indiana this year, and Oklahoma about 10 years ago became a right-to-work state. Um, and what we've done was we looked at the growth in the non-right-to-work states versus the right-to-work states, and we just do a pretty simple correlation. Uh, but there has been some very good work done. Richard Vetter of Ohio University did a study for the Indiana Chamber of Commerce because they were pretty interested in this topic to see how it would affect business. They came out on the side of it being a very pro-job creation type policy. Also, there's uh, two academics from Oregon who did a study for what right to work would mean for the state of Oregon. And they really did a detailed econometrics look at it to say, here are the causatory, uh, here's the causation, and here's right to work is a causal factor uh, for some of the states, uh, you know, looking to create jobs. They estimated that it would create something like 100,000 new jobs for the state of Oregon over the next five to ten years if they were to become a right to work state. Now, the arguments from the other side of this, people that don't like right to work laws, come from a few different angles, but sometimes people have this slogan to say, uh, they'll sometimes say, well, right to work is right to work for less because it depresses wages or it depresses benefits or uh, that type of thing. Now, basically what right to work is, is, is generally um, in a, in a non-right to work state, you have to be a member of the union if you're in working in a unionized industry. Now, right to work is basically saying, you know, depend, doesn't matter what industry you work in, as an employee, you have the freedom to decide whether you join a union or not. That's what basically right to work is. And unfortunately, it's been demonized a little bit by folks that say it's right to work for less and it's going to depress wages. That evidence doesn't exist, uh, is what I've read based on some of the academic work done. Actually, the states with right to work laws have seen higher wage growth. Now, that's an important distinction to make because sometimes to obfuscate the, the data, some groups will say, well, look at the per capita income levels of the states that are non-right to work states or the states that have the highest tax rates, for instance. So they'll point to New York, which has high per capita income levels. But it ignores a very basic principle in economic analysis is that you can't look at a static data point like that and draw reasonable conclusions. You have to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, you look to have to look at the growth over a period of time. And the income growth the job growth and the generally standard of living growth in the states with right to work laws has been higher than the states without right to work laws. And so, you know, just based on the data and based on what we've heard from companies that say they won't even consider a state unless it's a right to work state, I think that the policy seems to be a good policy. And, and whether Michigan takes it up or not, that'll be more of a political question. But the economics of it seem to be pretty clear. Other questions? That was a long answer to a short question, so I don't want to scare any other questions away. Uh, 
That's a great question, and it's something I left out, and I wanted to deal with it here in questions, is why has Michigan moved up in our estimation of competitiveness? And Michigan, as I showed on one of the earlier slides, is now number 17, and has moved up significantly from just a couple of years ago when you were in the bottom, you know, 15 states. Uh, it's incredible kind of the turnaround, and, you know, you've seen the proof in the pudding, really, because of the job creation numbers. Michigan's now finally starting to see positive job creation for the first time in a couple of decades, I think, since probably the late 90s, anyways, the last time that we had positive job creation. One of the factors where I think Michigan saw the biggest bump and in terms of the states that got a good bounce in their rankings this year, Michigan was about at the top of the pack for states that saw their ranking improve the most. And I think part of that was, a good part of that was due to the fact that Michigan, as you alluded to, repealed the, per, uh, repealed the Michigan business tax, the MBT, which in our estimation of studying the tax policy across 50 states, the MBT was probably the worst business tax in America. Uh, it was an awful business tax that taxed uh, people on all sorts of different ways. It was a complex, convoluted tax where many businesses didn't have any mechanism to figure out their tax liability because no other state taxes like the MBT. It, it hit small businesses hard because it would tax them at the business income and it would tax them on the personal level, so they were being double taxed. And so, as you mentioned, now C-Corps um, are paying a flat 6% income tax now, which is a huge uh, benefit from what they used to pay under the old MBT and now the you're right small businesses just pay on the individual side of the income tax code they don't pay the corporate income tax which actually is much more normal that treatment of it across most states most of the time S corps LLC's and other pass-through entities just pay on the individual side of the tax code and, and that's, in fact, a, a great point because as we're doing these comparisons on the nine states without personal income taxes versus the states with the highest personal income taxes, you know, you think about, well, the big beneficiaries there are the big, you know, multimillionaire individual earners. No, I mean, some of the biggest beneficiaries of not having a personal income tax are the small businesses that are passed through entities that are paying on the individual side of the code. So that's a very good observation. Uh, so actually, it does benefit both C-Corps and S-Corps here in Michigan because both of them are paying significantly less than they were before. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question as well. But, you know, New Hampshire does very well on the tax side of things. Now, if, if rich states, poor states just measured tax variables, then New Hampshire would be in the top ten, no doubt about it. But since we look at regulation and labor policy as well, New Hampshire does struggle in a few of those areas. For instance, some of its workers' compensation costs are some of the highest in the country. Um, it's uh, not a right-to-work state right now, although next year it may become a right-to-work state. The debate is raging. I mean, it was passed in the legislature this year. The governor vetoed right-to-work. It went back. The legislature didn't have enough votes to override the veto. They're going to bring it back next year. And so things like right-to-work, workers' compensation costs, and a few of those items do weigh down New Hampshire from where it would be otherwise. But, you know, tax-wise, New Hampshire certainly in the top ten. I mean, considering especially where their neighbors are, in the tax rankings. I mean, New Hampshire is a light in the sea of darkness uh, in terms of New England. I mean, it's, it's tax purgatory up there in New England otherwise. It's awful. Um, now, one thing to be said, though, also, I think, interestingly enough, when you look at how New Hampshire does, as I mentioned, it, it funds schools where their educational attainment and outcomes are actually above many of your states in New England that spend much more per pupil on education. That's a pretty interesting idea to have is that how you can spend sometimes less on education by focusing more on results and getting a better results than spending like in DC we spend almost twenty thousand dollars per people per year and have some of the worst results in the country uh, that's kind of interesting about New Hampshire the other thing interesting about New Hampshire is it, it, the um, basically in we, we have a measure of income inequality in the states it's called the Gini coefficient and uh, something that we look at across the states is, you know, how, how that income inequality plays out. 
And it happens that when you look at New Hampshire's score on income inequality, because that could be a critique to say, well, yeah, you don't have income taxes, but you're just benefiting you know, the rich guys or whatever. New Hampshire actually has some of the most um, equal income uh, in terms of growth of incomes uh, than any state in New England. Many of the other states that have very high progressive tax rates, you would think they do this to redistribute income. It just doesn't work out that way. Uh, some of those states have much more income inequality than New Hampshire does, while New Hampshire avoids taxing income whatsoever. So those are a couple of other facts about New Hampshire that I find quite interesting, but the reason that they're not doing better is the other non-tax factors. Other questions? Well, uh, Jonathan, I think you uh, have made Northwood proud with your achievements. Uh, you're certainly one of the leading experts in the nation on uh, state tax policy, and we appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Before I totally conclude here, I should mention I put my contact information on here for anybody who's interested in getting involved in, in policy. If you're in interested in coming out to Washington, D.C., please look me up. Uh, if you'd ever like an internship or things like that, you want to get involved in free enterprise policy, here's my phone number, my email address. If you're on Twitter, you can follow my Twitter feed, Alec underscore tax. You can like Rich States, Poor States on Facebook. We've got our own presence there. Uh, and as well as we will have books for sale uh, right after this. I'll be able to stick around. They're normally $20. We're going to do a Northwood discount. So it'll be $10 for you if you'd like a hard copy of Rich States, Poor States. So thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>